All right, then. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I so nice to meet you like this. And wow, you got <laughs> dressed up so nice and beautiful. And yeah. Here. You are not hiking today, right? I probably will later, yeah. Okay. Yes, I really want to know um, how you schedule your icon. Is it like uh, an everyday thing for you? No, it's We're going not. To, we'll, we will get into that. We will get into that later on. You're welcome to this Instagram live. Thank you. Uh, and um, it's a special day. It's a special one because we're celebrating children. It's Children's Day here in Nigeria. Happy and Children's of course, Day. I yes, thank children. you. Because, yes, I also love children and I'm also a child. <laughs> yes. Right. I think my parents are still alive, so I'm also a child. And so we're actually going to be celebrating children living with disabilities mm -hmm. because this category of children are sometimes left out. Sometimes well, um, well-meaning people remember them and decide that you may decide to throw a party for them uh, like, like today. But after throwing the party for them, it's like all about them is forgotten until another children's day. But with Everett and Austin Project in Corporation New York, it's going to be an everyday thing for this special kind of children. It's yes. not going to be once in a year that we remember them and then it's, they're all forgotten. No. But before we go into the details on how you plan to support this category of children here in Africa, Nigeria to be precise, let's get to meet you. Who is we? Who is Tim Gillian? Well, let me. My camera messed up. Let me try to do this again. Sorry. Um, Tim Gillian. I was born in 1966, so that makes me 55 years old. I was born in wow. New York. Wow. <laughs> 55. I was born in New York, in the United States of America. And I grew up pretty normal, um, very healthy, very athletic. Um, I was good in school, got good grades, um, ended up going to college, Bible college. I got a bachelor's in Bible. And then, okay. I, got a, and then I got a master's degree in linguistics. And my plan was to be a Bible translator in uh, helping people in remote places to have their language down into writing okay. and then be able to put their language, their remote language, um, put books in the Bible and, and other books into their language so they can read in their own mother tongue, we call it, uh, mother tongue language. So hmm. I'm sure in Nigeria there are people in very remote places that, that don't speak English very well and, and so that was the that was the goal, was to be able to help people like that, um, to be able to read, learn uh, about God. And I got saved uh, as a Christian in 1982. I was 16 okay. years old, and it was pretty dramatic conversion experience for me. Um, and then things started to change, and I, I really started to care about other people. And I was a missionary, like I said, for nine years with Wycliffe Bible Translators, and uh, from 1989 to 1998. And in 97 is when my now ex-wife and I found out that our three-year-old and our one-year-old had Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And so that, mm -hmm. that threw, threw a major curveball into my life, our life, their life, um, and... You know, I believe it was God's way of, of uh, teaching me how to be a better father, how to be a, a better human being. And um, I learned so much from my kids and being their father. And I want to share it. Yes, I would like you to actually share that part that has to do with your kids. Mm -hmm. uh, because I guess that was what motivated the Everett and Austin project. Right. And that's the story behind the Everett and Austin project. So let's get to, you know, let's get to hear more about Let's get to hear the full story. 
Yes. Um, my son's Everett and Austin. Uh, Everett was born in 1994, and Austin was born in 1996. And in 97, they were diagnosed with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Now, my ex-wife, their mom, was told in the early 1980s that she was not a carrier of the disease. And her brother died from it in 1982 when she was 18 and he was 15. His name was Perry. And so it was a, it was a very tragic, you know, time for my ex-wife and, and her family. Okay, okay. Okay, are you saying that your ex-wife had a brother who was actually suffering from Dutchney muscular dystrophy? Duchenne. Duchenne, sorry. Duchenne muscular dystrophy. She dystrophy. had a brother. Yes. She had a brother who was suffering uh, from this um, disease, right? Yes. The disease is genetic, and, and I don't know if you want to get to that part yet, but I do have, like, some official language <laughs> that describes the disease. Uh, okay. In a moment, I can share that. But, yeah, it's genetic. It, it's on the X chromosome, um, and it, so then it comes from the mother. In most cases, sometimes it's just a m mutation. But okay. um, usually, in 75% of Duchenne cases, it comes from the mother, and the rest is just a, a mutation out of nowhere. But mm -hmm. she, so she was told she was not a carrier. Okay. But in 1986, the mm -hmm. scientists discovered the gene for Duchenne, and she was not tested after that. She was only tested before they discovered the gene. And before they discovered the gene, um, she was told she was not a carrier from what limited testing that, uh, they had available. Um, but then, you know, so I married her, we had kids, we were thinking they, that she was not a carrier, they would not have Duchenne. But it was a big surprise in 97 when we found out when she started seeing signs, and I, I want to go over that too, some of the early signs that you start to notice where um, your your kid will have, that your kid might have Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and, and I have those, uh, I can go over those in a moment too. But, um, but yeah, she started seeing the signs, and I would say one of the factors in the demise of our marriage was the fact that I was in denial and I was not really emotionally available, <laughs> and um, I couldn't believe it that my sons had Duchenne, but she was right, and she got them tested. They had the muscle biopsy, and sure enough, they had Duchenne muscular dystrophy. She knew what was coming because of her experience with her brother, okay. you know, because she was a caretaker, part-time caretaker of her brother, and uh, I had no clue what was coming. I um, and, you know, I can tell you more. I don't know what your questions are, but please feel free to ask. Stop okay. Me. I, I think <laughs> I actually, I, 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 I got carried away with um, your story. I was processing it, and um, in one way, I was a bit emotional about it. Uh, but, but, but now let's actually get to what, what exactly is Doshin muscular that's trophy. What okay. is, how, how will you describe it? What are the symptoms? Is it common? Is it synonymous with people in Africa? Or is it synonymous, synonymous with white people? They're great questions. And um, um, you asked a bunch that I don't know where quite where to start. <laughs> okay. But I will try to start somewhere. <laughs> yeah, and try to answer everything. If I don't answer something, then please review and uh, okay, quiz me, because there's a lot to learn. There's really it's not just white yeah. people. Um, okay, it, let me just say it, it's not by race, not at all. It's totally genetic, and um, so let me just read um, from the official document that I can forward. I highlighted some things to share, but okay. I can forward. I have a PDF for this this I could forward to you or to anybody who wants to read more about it. But let okay. me just read a few things. Duchenne muscular dystrophy is a genetic disorder 
characterized by progressive weakness and degeneration of the skeletal muscles that control movement. Okay. It, it's classi classified as a dystrophinopathy, dystrophinopathy, a muscle disease that results from the deficiency of a protein called dystrophin. So that's the official language, and let me try to get my face middle here. I can keep losing it. Um, okay, so uh, Duchenne is the harshest form of muscular dystrophy. There's there's over 40 kinds of muscular dystrophies, okay. and, and Duchenne is the harshest form, in my in my opinion. Another one that is up there with being very harsh, in, in, and sometimes it's classified as muscular dystrophy, sometimes as a nerve thing. It's, okay. it's ALS. What is it? Is? ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. Wow. What was what, what, the link between Duchenne and cerebral palsy? It's not, there's no real link of between okay. the two. Um, we okay. Do help, we do help kids with cerebral palsy in, the, in our organization, but there's no um, genetic link or, or science link to between Duchenne and cerebral palsy. Okay. Now the the commonality that the 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 thing the reason why we do help with cerebral palsy is because it's a rare disease. Just mm. like Duchenne muscular dystrophy is a rare disease. So this project that I started, it's named after my sons, Everett and Austin, and the tagline, if you read our tagline, we are bravely facing Duchenne muscular dystrophy and other rare diseases in developing countries. Now, how how long did your son live, and how were you able to cope um, while they were alive? Was it quite challenging? Did you get support? And uh, let's know how it worked like. <laughs> Here you go again with all these questions. There's there's a number of ways I could answer all of that. Um, Sorry, have to. <laughs> please ask me one at a time. But um, okay. Yeah, um, very very difficult. Um, you know, as a parent, it's it's difficult to watch your children suffer. And um, I'm afraid I'm going to get emotional, but. Um, it's tough. It's tough to see your kids um, suffer and lose abilities. Um, as a parent, I wanted to encourage them to keep doing things as long as they could. What happens with Duchenne muscular dystrophy and other dystrophies is they lose abilities. They, their muscles get so weak. So with Duchenne, they stop being able to walk around age 10. And so one of the challenges was encouraging them, them to walk as long as they could versus mm -hmm. my oldest son, Everett, one time he said, Daddy, I want to use the wheelchair. And I said, well, you can still walk a little bit. And, and he said, but I fall a lot and it hurts. And, and so I said, okay, let's use the wheelchair then. Um, you know, what do you do? You want to encourage your kid to keep trying as long as he can. But then, so the, the, the balance then is, I don't want to push him so much that he falls down and hurts his head or something, you know. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but emotionally, you know, I want to be there and support him as he's going through this difficult challenge in his mind. You know, he is like, I don't want to walk. I'm afraid I'm going to fall, you know. Mm. And so daddy pushed me in the wheelchair, you know. So <laughs> so around age 10 is, is when um, both Everett and Austin needed to have a wheelchair. Everett, I mean, Austin was a little bit longer. He was around age 11 when he really needed, needed a wheel, wheel, wheelchair. And um, yet the next... Big, I mean, there's a lot of little challenges along the way, but the next big challenge of, of what they lost 
was around age 14 when they stopped being able to lift their hands off their lap, you know, to feed themselves or to scratch their eyebrow or whatever. You know, their muscles in their limbs, their outer limbs were so weak, they couldn't, you know, lift their hands. So around age 14. And so, and, and that was tough to watch. Um, you know, and by then, you know, the parents, caretakers were, um, and, you know, we had caretakers here in the U.S. We had great care for our kids here in the U.S. Um, we had we had help, um, lots of help. And so, you know, we would put the hand on the, on the table for them or, you know, by the mouse, you know, that we would put the hand by the mouse so they could move the mouse a little bit um, so they could be on the computer. I mean, we, my kids had that, you know. There's a lot of kids that we're meeting in the Everett and Austin project who barely have food, you know. And and so that's really where our focus is, is to, to try to help improve the quality of life for kids that are going through this and, and other rare diseases. And um, I don't think I answered all your questions. You, you, you tried. You, you, answered, you answered almost all the questions. Now, okay. I want to, I, I, I want to ask you because I know that um, you you you're quite familiar with this um, rare disease, and is it curable? No, it's not curable. And um, um, what's the lifespan of children or people living with this? rare disease, rare ailment, ailment. What, what's the lifespan? Well, in 97, when my kids were diagnosed, we were told that they would live to be between the ages of 15 and 20. In 1997, the average lifespan was 15 to 20. Nowadays, the lifespan is between 20 and 30 for most cases. Some people outlive 30, which is very rare when they have Duchenne. Hmm. And my son's Austin. It's, it's tough. My son. We need to have um, I I can say I'm like, I I can imagine what you pass what you pass through, but from your story, I I feel a bit um, emotional about it. Yeah, yeah, I, I can sense that, and I, I feel it too, and I've been feeling it all week, especially yesterday and today as I've been preparing with, you know, and reading some of the things again and thinking about my kids. It's, you know, I I start to get choked up, you know. It's, it's tough. It's, it's really hard. And um, I know I didn't answer all your questions because there are other things I wanted to say that I'm thinking of right now. Um but um, so um, I never cried so I never cried so much in my entire life when both of my sons died, and it was like it wasn't like okay I'm gonna cry now or okay I don't want anybody to watch me crying. I just it just came out like a fire hydrant. It was like shh, you know fire hydrant tears, involuntary. They I mean I never cried like that when each of my sons died. Austin died in 2012. He was 16. And Everett died in 2017. He was 22. Wow. So was it at that point you decided to start supporting children with rare disease in Africa? Not, a, not at yet. What, at what point did you decide that you really need to help? Because I know that we have had conversation which you've said that when your, your son's passed on, you felt that, well, they had all the support and all the medical care in New York. What about children in Africa who wouldn't get half of all the support your, ch your children had the privilege to have? Was it immediately or did it take you some time to decide on this? First, let me clarify. Um, my ex-wife is from Minnesota, so... Um I do want to give a shout out to the state of Minnesota because for most of their life, they were raised there and I lived in Minnesota so that I can be a present dad. I moved to Minnesota to be with them 
to be their dad. And the state of Minnesota helped us with a lot. <laughs> I mean, it was a lot of money, a lot of support that uh, the state of Minnesota helped us with. So they they were not raised in New York. I, I'm from New York, and I live there now again. But, okay. But Minnesota was so helpful to us. Um, and let me get back to your question, your main question. What was it again? What did I? Okay. You asked if I immediately, whenever died, wanted to do the Everett and Austin project. No. Um, I, and I still grieve. I'm still working through a lot of the grief. Um, but there's a lot I could say about that. There's everybody processes grief differently. And I definitely, it was tough. Like the grief of losing your kids uh, never goes away. You know, the pain is still there. And uh, I miss them. You know, I look. I have their pictures around around the office here where I live, and uh, I keep them up because I love them and I miss them. But it's tough. Hi Pam. I see Pam doing. Hi Pam. I keep the pictures up, and um, you know, it keeps it real. It keeps them close to my heart. I love my kids. Um, but no, it took about a year and a half after Everett died. The second one died before I did some searching on Google and I found a video in Uganda of a man who has three boys still. He has three boys going through Duchenne muscular dystrophy in terrible poverty. And I have a link I can send it to you for the um, news report. Uh, that sh It was a five minute news report that I saw by Josephine Karunji, shout out to Josephine Karunji, um, who found this family and this man that the wife left, the, the mother of these three boys left in Uganda. Wow. And the because maybe she couldn't cope any longer. Yeah. And a little history of that is, and there's a lot of history, but a little history is the mother is Ugandan. And the father is a Rwandan refugee. Oh. So the father, I guess, was accused or seen as the culprit, the one who caused okay. what was happening to the kids because they didn't know what was happening to the kids at the time when mm -hmm. she left. And, um, you know, come to find out after the fact, after the news report, and thanks to Josephine, Mr. Kayonga knows what the disease is, that it's Duchenne. Um, he had already lost two boys. So he has actually had five boys with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And the mother left thinking that it was his fault, but she's the carrier. Oh. So who knows where she is? We still don't know. And, and the mother, you know, is she having more kids with Duchenne? Mm hmm. That, you know, there's so much, uh, there's no, like, intelligence about the disease. And, and, and so she left thinking it was the refugees' fault when it wasn't. And this father, I love this man. I, I, I help him to this day. Um, and his uh, name no, is so, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Sure. This Go ahead. family, this family, did they know that the children were actually suffering from Duchenne? Or right. maybe they felt that it was a spiritual attack or something, you know, after Correct. that? Correct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They didn't know. And so she left thinking it was the Rwandan refugee's fault, you know, for whatever reason that he had a demon or whatever reason, you know, they, I don't know. We don't know why she left or gave up um, and left her children, you know, um, with her daughter. They, they had five boys with Duchenne and one daughter. And so the mother and the daughter left, and we don't know where they are. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, the two oldest boys died, Gerald and Richard. And now there's Julius, Herbert, and Emma that are still alive. Julius is 18, suffering greatly. Um, we gave him a wheelchair, among other things, to help. Um, we cemented their floor so that the wheelchairs can can get around the house. It's a very small house. And 
Herbert is 14, 15 now, and Emma is 10 or 11 now. And Emma, the last we knew, he was still walking a little bit, but um, but he's falling a lot. And so uh, a couple months ago, he fell and hurt his arm badly and had to go in the hospital, and we paid, we paid for that, for the hospital care to um, take care of, of um, his arm. He's better now for his arm. But I don't think he's walking as much as he was. So Emma is such a dear heart. Um, and, um, you know, we push solar electricity in the home. Um, you know, we pay for their school fees. We, you know, and this is this is the, the first family that we started helping with the Everton. What year was uh, this? Well, in 2018, October of 2018, which was a year and a half after Everett died, um, is when I decided to start the Everett and Austin project, um, named after my sons, to help kids in Africa, and especially sub-Saharan Africa, going through Duchenne and other rare diseases. So it took, it was, it was just brand new. You know, I had no money, and I didn't, I mean, I had a very, very poor job and um, did not know what to do. It took like a year before I raised enough money to go visit the Cuyongas and um and and bring over the wheelchairs and two of two other people on the board went with me so three of us went to visit them one of them was a doctor of uh, uh, occupational therapy she was wonderful the kids felt so special when we showed up and dr tina was in her white um doctor coat you know and their stethoscope and the kids felt right in their home right in in the front of their on their porch that the kids were like, they couldn't wait for their turn for Dr. Tina to, to, uh, to, to look at them. And, uh, um, so we, we made it there, um, you know, a couple months before that, when we found them, it took a while to find them. Um, but when we first found them, we, of course, we brought some food and, um, one of the things we brought was a bag of rice, a big bag of rice. And the kids had, you know, the father, Paul Kayonga, had been going to the garden. I don't know what the garden means, but far away, a couple miles, to try to find yams, plain white. Or maybe yams. the farm, maybe going to the farm. Yeah, I don't know. To get food. The, he was trying to find yams in, in the garden is what they called it. So, and he was having trouble finding yams. And yams, if you know... Uh, are not very tasty and you know there's no seasoning they were white they're not like in america we we think of yams as sweet potatoes which that's very tasty but these yams over there um were not tasty plain white um worse than potatoes and um, plain white irish potatoes you know <laughs> it, they're plain white they're delicious my, if it's garnished with different kind of salt and they didn't have any of that. So they were getting tired of just eating those plain yams. And we brought a bag of rice. And something that rings in my ear that motivates me so much is listen, because we videotaped when we gave them this food when we first met them. And, and we brought out this bag of rice. And one of my guys, he says, this is rice, you know, trying to give them the English word rice. And Emma, the youngest, he says, Rice, you know, with this high pitched race, you know, and Herbert was sitting behind him and he reached over and he touched his Emma's shoulder, and, you know, and they were so well, excited, they were ecstatic to get a bag of rice, you know, and that just rings in my heart and my ears because wow, you know, um, they were excited and we touched them you know, and, and we made a difference in their life with a bag of rice. And, you know, we've done a lot more than that since, but, um, and that's what, and not just with that family, not just right. with that family, I guess with some other family in Africa. Correct. Um, right. okay. Apart from helping families mm -hmm. who have children suffering from this kind of disease and other rare disease, how are you helping to create awareness about this? Because to be honest with you, um, when James 
told me about you and what you did, what what you do. Let's shout that out to like, him, James, uh, yeah. James two, two <laughs> son, James two son. Is he right? watching? Yes, From, definitely. And he has a he has a ministry in Haiti for for needy children, and and he connected me and you because he's like yeah. I think. I think Toyin will be very happy to interview you, Tim, because of Africa and da da da. You know, so a shout out to James and his Haiti project, New Haiti. What's it called? New yeah. Haiti Enterprises. Enterprises. I was going to say that New Haiti. Yes, thanks, James, for connecting All us. Right. <laughs> so when you mentioned businesses, Dushin, I was like, I've never heard this before. I know cerebral palsy and some other, but have ever heard this before. Now, what have you been doing to create more awareness, especially in Africa? Yeah, um, and that's a loaded question also, even though it's a simple question. I mean, it's only one question. Um, here's one thing, and I could forward you this, and I, I think I did forward you this, the flyer. Yes, yes, yes. This is, this we have a flyer. flyer. What is Duchenne? What are the early signs of Duchenne? And then on the back side, if you make it front and back, it says our mission statement and some of the things we're doing. So we have flyers. We have many web pages. We have one web page. Actually, one, the EvertonAustinProject.org is our web page. But we have many social media pages, I should say, clarify. We have the Everton Austin Project. Facebook page, we have a Hike for Duchenne, which we can get to that shortly. Um, Hike for Duchenne group, it's a group on Facebook. And I have a page on LinkedIn, the Everton Austin Project, a, a page on LinkedIn for Hike for Duchenne, a page on LinkedIn for Hike for Africa, which that's another, oops, that's another um, thing we're going to, that we a fundraiser arm of, of the Everton Austin project. And, okay. Uh, so, I'm sorry. So, we do social media. Okay. Just social media? No, well, we do a lot more. Um, okay. We're doing this. We're doing this interview. We were on TV in Uganda. Okay. Uh, Josephine, Josephine Karunji, shout out. Josephine Karunji. I call her the Oprah of, of Uganda. Uganda. <laughs> but we were on her show um, when we were when we visited um, in 2019, and I have a link to that too if you want to watch our 45 minute okay. TV, TV show. Um, um, so we do lots of things. We also do the hike for Duchenne uh, across the world. We have people in the Philippines. We have people in Cameroon. We have people in Nigeria. We have people in in Uganda and Kenya who are hiking for Duchenne. And it's a fundraiser, but it's also a, um, an awareness thing. It really helps create awareness. Like, like right now, um, here's my, my, my list. Let me just show you. We're currently, we are doing hike for Duchenne. Oh, what's happening to your camera? I know, it just keeps falling. I'm so sorry. I thought I had a good setup here. I don't. Let me change this. That'll be better. Yeah, okay, better. okay. Okay, so this is my chart. I have 480 people who have pledged. Oh, to hike for Duchen. No, um, not to hike, but to, for my miles uh, and other people's miles. We have 480 people who have signed up for High Produce Shen 7. This is the seventh one we're doing. Um, mm -hmm. To pledge a certain amount of money, of donation, for each mile that we do. So, mm -hmm. right this spring, I'm doing 400 miles. And I just got to 370 miles, and I expect to get to the 400 miles before Labor Day. No, hmm. Memorial Day. Sorry, Memorial Day, which is Monday. I expect okay. to get yes, that's the first of May. By the end of May, I'll have 400. It goes from March 22nd through June 21st. June 21st is the end of spring. And, and so I'll have it done by the end of May, the 400 miles. 
But like basically the pitch, the sales pitch that I do, I say to mm, my friends on LinkedIn, on Facebook and Instagram, I say, I'm hiking 400 miles for Duchenne this spring. Would you be able to pledge something for my miles? One cent per mile is only four dollars. Mm. Try to keep it simple, keep it low, and some people pledge more. Some people only pledge. Some people pay, pledge less. They're like, oh, I can be a dollar. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and then some people say more. They want to give me a dollar per mile or. The biggest one I had, and I I don't know if she wants to be shout out like this on this on this. Um, I'm I'm sure she'll be watching this later. She's one of my Instagram friends. On one of my Instagram posts, I, I, you can I'll give her a shout out. You can give her a shout out. Everything I, for you. Last year when she was donating, she wanted to be anonymous, and so. Okay. Okay. I'm I'm trying to keep it anonymous still for her because, but. On one of my high production seven spring four hundred mile spring posts, she says, "Put me down for twenty five dollars a mile." <laughs> think, think, of, think about it that four hundred times twenty five. That's ten thousand dollars. That's a lot of money. Ten thousand dollars. So, she's been amazing. Um, I, I'll, I'll keep her anonymous. I don't want. To so how often, flooded. how often do you get people to support you? Well, how I, often I, do you I, get I, funding? I'm, I'm at it a few times a week to get to 480, 80 pledgers. I, I'm at it a few times a week, um, okay. trying to get pledgers. And um, so I produce Shen seven. High produce Shen six. We did last fall, the entire fall season. We raised all together at the end. We raised ten thousand dollars. Now, for High Production Seven, we got ten thousand dollars pledged um, just before the event started. Like in mid March is when she said, "Put me down for twenty-five. That's ten thousand. We we already have it pledged before we started. And now since then, I have raised another nine thousand. In, in pledging. So right now on this chart, on this, I have $19,000 in pledging. Hmm. That hasn't all come in. About 5,000 has come in now. About 5,000 has come in so far, which I'm very thankful for. It helps us to do things like send wheelchairs to your kids, the, the five or six kids that you have. You have yes. You have, yes, I have six kids. I have six kids that you've actually uh, established that you will support with well, wheelchair wheelchairs for sure and then maybe on a monthly basis we can do more I know your monthly Thank expenses you. your monthly expenses for the one child was about $295 right yeah um, yeah 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 the one the one uh, BC is that his name your nephew yes yes my nephew BC what does he have what is his illness do you know um Sorry, I didn't get your question. What What is his illness? It's not Duchenne. He's not Duchenne. It's cerebral palsy. Oh, it's cerebral. Okay, yeah. And also the children from the orphanage, mercy of yeah. God, they also suffer from cerebral palsy. Oh, the all six are cerebral palsy. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. And I know the I know the first five need a wheelchair, and, and I feel like we can do that.